Good afternoon, everybody, and thanks for joining us for our latest webinar in our Business Booster webinar series. Today's webinar is on mosquito control, and it's sponsored by Syngenta. I'm PCT Senior Digital Brad Harbison, and I'll be moderating today's event. We think you're going to find today's webinar valuable and timely, as we know a lot of uh, PCT readers are just beginning the busy spring season, and there's a real need for information on mosquitoes and mosquito control, which is a popular popular and growing segment in the pest control industry. So during the next 90 minutes, we're gonna be hearing from a pair of mosquito experts, Dr. Claudia Regal and Dr. Nikki Gallagher, who have a wealth of experience dealing with mosquitoes, both in the field and in the lab. So our format for today is we're gonna hear from Claudia first and then uh, followed by Nikki. And so we encourage everyone to ask their questions throughout the webinar, and you can do so by entering them into the Q&A interface that's at the bottom of your screen. We're going to collect all those questions, and what we're going to do is uh, we're going to ask those questions um, at the end of both at the end of the entire webinar after Nikki's done uh, speaking. So again, ask them throughout. We'll collect them, and uh, and also uh, both Claudia and, and Nikki will try to get to some of those and answer them via messaging as well. So. A uh, couple different ways you can get your question answered. So, um, so as I mentioned, um, we're going to hear from Claudia Regal first and a little bit about Claudia. She is a graduate of Purdue University and she earned her PhD from the Entomology and Nematology Department at the University of Florida. And Claudia currently serves as the director of the City of New Orleans Mosquito, Termite and Rodent Control Board. And in this position, she provides technical support for the City of New Orleans and the pest control industry. And she conducts independent research, working closely with industry. And she also collaborates with government organizations and, uni and universities on research projects. And with that, I'm gonna turn things over to Claudia. Thanks so much. I appreciate the invitation. This is uh, really wonderful to be here with everyone today. So I'm gonna talk a lot about mosquitoes and mosquito control and how it relates um, to you know, a city level, but also things that people can do, companies and businesses um, at that uh, local level. So again, today I'm gonna talk really about mosquito biology, some of the life cycle, some species of importance because it does change where you are in the country. Um, I'm just gonna touch on mosquito-borne disease just to make you aware of a few things. And of course, I'm all about best practices, right? So it's the use of integrated mosquito management. So very important when you're managing mosquitoes to use all the tools you have available. And of course, I'm also gonna talk about some considerations, things like non-target organisms, such as bees or, or, or the other insects. So important for us to talk about that. We really need to start at the basic. I mean, I start almost all of my presentations this way, but Really, mosquitoes are flies, okay, that bite. They're in the group, it's a diptera, so two wings is what they have. Uh, they're true flies. Um, other examples would be gnats and midges as well, uh, including flies. So that's where they fit. And so they have four stages to their life cycle. You've got uh, eggs, larva, pupa, and of course you've got an adult, male and female. Um, and those aquatic versions, especially the larvae is what we're really talking about, um, they feed on bacteria in other decaying organisms. So they're filter feeders. And so I'm telling you all these things because I want you to think about sort of the control implication of it. If we're using a bacterial larvicide, uh, pupa don't feed. So, you know, what would you use then? then? So this is the reasoning and the rationale behind talking about this. So let's talk a little bit about eggs. Um, it depends on the species. Some mosquitoes will lay their eggs near the surface of the water, just maybe on, you know, above that edge of the water. Um, you can see a photograph here. These are 80s eggs and they look like little tiny specks of dirt and they're able to adhere to that surface. You've got others such as Anopheles, they lay singly, their eggs, their eggs singly on the surface on the water. And then Culex species, you can see a picture of a, a raft, a close up. It's all these little eggs that are attached together um, called a raft, and that's what they're laying on top of the water. So um, then the next stage would be the larvae, and they go through four de developmental uh, stages called instars. And we look at that as well to see when exactly should you be, you know, larviciding and what should you use. 
When do we think they're going to develop into the pupa? So we're looking at these different stages of instars. Pretty important. Again, depending on the mosquito, you've got about five to 14 days. And um, so, but that's going to vary uh, on that. And about the fourth stage, fourth stage in larvae is about a quarter of an inch long. Again, that depends on the mosquito, but that's about an average. Um, and a lot of times you can just have a tiny bit of water, especially our 80s albopictus and our 80s aegypti, tiny little bottle cap, that's all you need uh, for them to breed and grow. So now the pupa, pretty important stage again, this is right before the adult, right? So there's some metamorphosis going on in there and it depends on the temperature and the species, but about one to four days. Um, they move around a little bit, uh, but they will dive down uh, when you're getting closer if they're feeling threatened. So uh, you have to be very careful when you're going into these bodies of water, it could be a container, a pond or whatever it may be, and you're putting your dipper in there to collect mosquitoes you may actually not even see them because they were diving to the bottom. Now, when you reach to the, they reach the adult stage, you're gonna have males and females. And there's a great photograph of an, uh, an adult mosquito hatching. Um, and so on that surface of the water, and that surface tension is gonna help it, you know, stay onto that water and then eventually fly away. So the males have a very plumose, you know, antennae. Um, and then the females do not. So only the females bite, right? And they need that blood, uh, that protein uh, for egg development. So when <laughs> we look at feeding and uh, reproductive behavior, it's pretty important here. The females, they're looking for that blood meal. They need it for their, their eggs. And they may be queuing into body odors. Uh, carbon dioxide from our breath, also body heat. And just as a side note, one of the lures that we use for one of the traps, our BG Sentinel traps that we use, we actually insert a tube, um, the lure that smells like body odor. So it, it's basically like going into a gym or a locker room after her, you know, the kids have been out. It is really stinky. So that's what they're queuing into. Females mate once, uh, they store sperm for life. And of course they need blood for the eggs as we've talked about and depending on the species, four to five batches of eggs in her lifetime. Now there are a lot of different mosquitoes out there, about 3,500 globally, about 176, right in the US. And uh, about 10% of those maybe are vectors uh, of some sort of pathogen disease that we need to worry about. So here in New Orleans, I mean, we're just really worried about five or six, you know, that are a really big concern. There are bridge vectors. We'll talk about that in a few minutes that we need to watch out for. And then of course, we're always looking to see what is potentially coming in from the outside. Um, bites are, are a risk year round in some places. Uh, here in New Orleans, it's rarely below freezing. And um, we've got our winter mosquitoes that come out, but of course, grew up in Illinois, it's cold, right? During the winter, so you don't really need to worry about it. So there's a lot of seasonality. Um, how do we protect ourselves, right? We're gonna talk a lot about that. And then it is very important at the community level, but also at the local level, what our pest management professionals are doing um, to help out. So mosquitoes are classified by breeding habitat. We're talking flood water, permanent water, or container uh, breeders, right? And a lot of us, as we're doing inspections of properties and your homes, you're going to run into mostly container, but it's important for you to know uh, what the area around you uh, or that property, your customer's property looks like because there may be floodwater issues and there may be permanent water. And so you need to understand sort of the dynamics of what's going on. So some of the examples here, <laughs> excuse me, a floodwater breeders would be found in the um, genera 80s and Culex and um, even Seraphora and Aclaritatus. And so there's, uh, you know, lots of different species. These uh, will bite humans, in some cases livestock and even our pets, they can emerge in really large number after rains. You know, we see that uh, here. Um, Florida has seen it, of course, after hurricanes and large areas of inland flood. So it can be huge numbers, and they can also, in some cases, be pretty strong flyers. This happens to be a picture out of our uh, federal marsh area uh, from a few years ago, 
but the eggs are laid just right above the surface uh, of that water in that mud. And in some cases, they're even actually laying as the soil dries out, um, that soil cracks and eggs are being laid all in there. And so when you get tidal flows that submerges that particular area, then you get these huge broods of mosquitoes that are hatching. So we also have other floodwater mosquitoes that are inland, so freshwater. And Aedes vexans happens to be a, a common one. Um, this is when one of our uh, park, city park in, New Orleans, in uh, the New Orleans um, region. And you can see that there are swales. And so those swales have filled up in lots and lots of pupae and larvae of Aedes vexans. Um, just another example, I don't have a photograph, but um, my mom lives outside of Chicago and she's got a retention pond. And the retention pond was put in uh, with the uh, neighborhood and ruts have been created through this small flow of water. And so actually Aedes vexans up in Illinois happens to, in her area happens to be the aggressive mosquito, uh, the nuisance mosquito that we're dealing with there. So let's just look a little bit about permanent water breeders. So it's important for you to understand what is around those properties that you're servicing. And actually some people even have ponds and oftentimes there are aquatic weeds, um, diff just different kinds of issues that it may have. But there, these mosquitoes such as Anopheles and Aedes species and Cochlatidia and Mansonia, which is an interesting one, and even Culex, especially in those organic waters, um, can be a problem. They're not normally going to be in the middle floating around, but they're on those shallow edges, um, those marshes and wetlands, and especially even water hyacinth and uh, water lettuce, that's a problem. And so there's an interesting mosquito, um, Ansonia cochle uh, and a cochlatidia, these two genera, and they actually have a little siphon that they insert into the plant and they're able to breathe using that stem of the plant is hollow, it's using it as a tube, a straw, uh, to gain its air. So oftentimes you have to look at storm, um, not storm water management, you have to do that too, but uh, looking at weed management uh, and water uh, issues um, to make sure that everything is essentially being taken care of. So permanent water breeders falls as another group, right? Here's an example of Aedes solicitans. And so this is actually another one that is found in our tidal uh, flood water areas in those marshes. And there's also a uh, culex cell in area. So there's lots of different species out there that are permanent. Uh, we also have other species of culex, uh, depending on where you are in the US, um, you can have either tarsalis, uh, we see restuans and salinarius and pipians. Uh, for us, it's the southern house mosquito, which is a Culex quinca faciata. So that's the one that we normally see. These are very important often in uh, vectoring different arboviruses, such as West Nile and St. Louis encephalitis. And we're going to talk a little bit about that. Um, they feed on birds. Some of them are primarily birds, but will feed on mammals as well. And in some cases, uh, especially mosquitoes with the, in the genera Culex, they can all, also be very opportunistic and get into containers. And actually we see our Southern house mosquito, that's one of our major pests of uh, weight in waste tires, um, mostly throughout this summer, uh, but we do see them and that's very important. Here's a nice example here of um, Culex quinks. It's laying its eggs. Uh, so she's laying her little egg raft right onto the water and surface tension is keeping all of that up. So we're gonna talk a little bit later about larvicides. And there are some oils that we use to break that surface tension. And you know those eggs aren't gonna be able to float and even that mosquito isn't gonna be able to float essentially on that water. So these uh, Culex species, often populations are relatively low in uh, spring and they will build throughout the summer. Uh, for us, they peak, um, you know, towards the end of summer, which is, I guess, August, July, August, um, but we're warm. And so in sometimes we're still having very high populations through October. That's going to vary um, on the location and the temperature um, in your region. Uh, they often prefer birds. Um, and actually right now we're really watching it closely because our Culex quinks, right, are starting to build up. And right now they're feeding on those birds 
Uh, unfortunately, you know, virus, West Nile virus is amplifying in that cycle between the birds and the mosquito. These often bite more readily at night. So very important to make sure that everybody takes the right precaution. We often see these in roadside ditches, a very organic, sept you know, just really nasty water, stinky and smelly, um, and wastewater treatment plants. So this is a large one, but in areas where water stagnates, or I guess the sewage is stagnating, that's a, a common place that we will see. So it's important for you, again, to know what is around um, so that you can really you know, provide the best service for your customer. So container breeders, this again, very common, right? Uh, tires and saucers are a huge issue with us here. Kids toys uh, and bromeliads. You know, Florida has a ton of bromeliads as ornamentals. And so water accumulates, we see that as well. And then of course there are the natural containers such as tree holes. Um, there were natural containers before plastic showed up, right? So that's usually, you know, a big issue. So make sure that you're checking your trees and um, different places, maybe where water is accumulating um, so that yeah, it's able to be addressed. And so when it comes to containers, right? Uh, for us, uh, Aedes albopictus, uh, we also see Aedes aegypti uh, quite a bit. It just depends where you are and what mosquitoes, but we see a lot of Culex uh, species in our containers. Old tires, big issue in a lot of different places, uh, backyards. But please make sure because a lot of you will have access to everyone's backyards. And so look at those bird baths and the flower pot containers. And if you have swimming pools or even kind of toys or tarps, pet dishes, rain gutters, right? Big problem. Sometimes that fills up and it's just water accumulates. Uh, but just make sure that um, the water is draining or it is circulating. Um, so that you can, um, you know, avoid those locations for mosquitoes to lay eggs. The two big ones, of course, uh, Aedes aegypti mosquito, uh, the range, it just really depends. We're going to show you, I'm going to show you that in a minute here on the range, but Aedes albopictus, that's a lot, mostly throughout the U.S. And our Culex quinks are found in containers. That's where we mostly find them. So even though they're really can be considered permanent water, they're also container breeders for us. So pretty important. When it comes to mosquito control, right? Or pest control, you know, because we do a lot of work with rodents. It's all about integrated pest management. So um, integrated mosquito management in this particular case, it uses a combination, right? Of methods to control mosquitoes. And we really have to have a good understanding of mosquito biology, life cycle, um, how they spread, different kinds of pathogens. And we're also looking at a whole lot of different ways of getting this information. And I'm gonna go through really each one. So we're really talking about surveillance and a lot of source reduction. There are some good options for biological control. And of course, the use of insecticides, uh, both larvicides and adulticides. You know, our program has an airplane we have spray trucks, we have larvicide rigs that go on, uh, you know, behind a vehicle. Um, so all these tools are there. We also do resistance testing in-house. And of course, public education is a huge part of everything we do, um, including the industry. So let's talk a little bit about surveillance and why we do it. And of course, I'm going to be talking about it from a large scale because our surveillance is the entire city, right? And um, but you can also do this on smaller scales. And so it's important to keep checking and understanding what's going on. And why are we doing this to begin with? But we really want to understand where the term, where the termites are, right? But it's termite season coming, where the mosquitoes are, um, and when are they showing up? So it's where and when. And we're going to look at this year after year after year. And actually, we do it every single week of the year. There's just a few weeks here and there out of the year. But for, for most of the year, it's, it's, it's weekly. And so we have a really good idea and a good pulse on what's going on with the populations. So we also look at weather. And we look at disease prevalence of when that's happening. And then we use these tools to make decisions about control if our control is working correctly. Um, and in some cases, they've even been able to find some new invasive species. 
And in a lot of ways too, we're able to know if the range of established species has changed at all. So when we're looking at a surveillance system, right, it's, it can be very daunting. Um, like how, where do you even begin? And we're able to really tailor according to the activities you wanna do in available resources. There are mosquito control programs that have millions of dollars. And then there are mosquito control programs that have just a few hundred thousand dollars, if that. So really decisions need to be made on what you can do and but be consistent with those resources. Activities are usually seasonal. Uh, even though we do weekly, you know, um, every single month surveillance, we're, we're not very cold. So I wanna know what is going on in the winter time with a different group of mosquitoes that come up. But the whole point here is to really look at that data, make decisions, control decisions, educational decisions so that we can prevent human disease. Now for everybody, this is really the basics that you need, okay? So let's say um, I own my own company and I am out there doing uh, pest management work or even mosquito control work you don't need all the fancy tools. I mean, these are some of the basics that you would need. You definitely need a dipper. And another one that we use all the time are gonna be turkey basters, but it really boils down to the person doing a really good inspection every single time. And um, I always carry vials, because if you don't know what you have um, and what mosquito you're dealing with, you need to make sure you get them identified because it matters on how you're going to be addressing con uh, the control. Another thing that's easy to do, <laughs> it doesn't cost any money, you just need to be careful. Um, sometimes people do this with Tyvek suits on, um, it's a thing called landing rates. And so your, um, our inspector here has some dry ice, right? Carbon dioxide. And he's standing out there and we count how many mosquitoes land on you uh, for usually about a minute. Um, in some cases you're out in the marsh and it's like, you're just getting bombarded. <laughs> so you take a count and extrapolate and get out of there. But you also need to be very, very careful if there's a West Nile or any other kind of uh, arboviral um, disease incidents you know, out there at that time. So it's gonna be important for you to stay in touch with what's going on at your state level on disease. All right, so there are a lot of, um, I think I just saw a message. I wanna make sure everybody can hear me because it sounds like it may be a little spotty, but um, your local mosquito abatement district, if you have one, are typically using different types of traps throughout your region um, to collect mosquitoes to make this kind of uh, information about management. Um, and it's also very important, again, to ID your mosquitoes. And this is for anybody um, because the way you would handle an Aedes epileptus is going to be very likely than you, uh, very different than you would with a Culex, for example. So, and they, you know, again, if you don't have the resources locally, look at your universities and local mosquito control district, they'll be able to help. And so just to give you an idea here in New Orleans, we have 46 locations that are every single week. And then of course we have a couple of others and with some projects that we do, um, but we use our city properties and city owned lots and all that kind of stuff to put these out. We use two major types of traps, gravid traps. They're gonna collect those Culex females that have already taken a blood meal. They're gonna go lay their eggs. Um, and then we also use BG Sentinel traps which are targeting our 80s mosquitoes. So we collect those mosquitoes, right? Monday, we put out the traps. Tuesday, we pick up and ID everything to species, count, look at all of that. And then we also work with LSU, Louisiana State University. Our state of Louisiana has a really great statewide surveillance program for, our, um, for different kinds of arboviruses. So we're able to send our samples, our mosquitoes to LSU on Wednesday, and we have the results on Friday which is great. So we know if our mosquitoes have virus in it or not. And I also see what is going on statewide. So it really gives you a great pulse on what is happening uh, disease wise in our state. And we're able to implement the appropriate controls um, to help reduce the risk, right? Of our residents um, acquiring some sort of disease, West Nile virus, for example. 
So all of that information is eventually funneled to the state uh, Department of Public Health. And those folks also upload everything to the Centers for Disease Control. So this information is constantly being updated. And so there's a lot of people working together. And so this is just a, a snapshot, but I wanted everybody to know this because you can go and look yourselves for your region. And it's uh, Arbonet is what it's called. And you can actually go back years looking at the incidence of West Nile. You can look at human cases. There's also veterinary cases will show up. And it's not only for West Nile, but it's for a lot of different um, diseases that are out there. So this is really is a great resource, especially um, if you're trying to get an idea what's going on your, that year. And every year is different. So when it comes also to surveillance, um, it's looking for larvae and pupae. So the immature stages. And so there's our guy uh, with a dipper and we're checking different areas and cemeteries and um, you can also look at tires and containers in the backyard. I mean, these are things that you really have to do on a co pretty consistent basis to get an idea of what issues might, ar might arise. For example, one of the things we do is uh, breeding site surveillance. So we are looking at swales that have been documented in tires and drainage ditches and all these kinds of infrastructure related issues from potholes to construction. Some of these are not entirely permanent, right? Especially the construction and the potholes. So those eventually get fixed, but we may have to deal with it. So again, this is citywide, but I want you to really think about your own properties right? And what is around it for you to then go in and inspect, right? So what you may have a swale that is a few blocks down from your property, but that might be a huge issue if it's loaded with larvae. <laughs> so surveillance programs really do a lot, all right? And so the Centers for Disease Control, that is fundamental to what we do. So it's really important. And they've been able to find new species. Uh, Aedes scapularis is one um, that is pretty new. It's been actually detected in Florida before in the 1940s, uh, but just in the last year or so, year and a half or so, they collected about 121 through routine surveillance down in Miami-Dade, so in Broward County. So it's likely here to stay. And so this came from a paper and um, the nice folks at PCT are gonna be sending all this out for you uh, post presentation, but you can read all about it. But um, you can see the little triangles uh, throughout Central and South America and the parts of the Caribbean. That is where that mosquito is established. And they also do suitability maps. So modeling to figure out where this mosquito could survive. And we're in that cone in New Orleans. So we're definitely going to have to watch it. But bottom line here, you know, what's the implication? You know, the implication is now you've got one more vector that's likely, you know, established that can actually transmit several diseases or several pathogens, right? Yellow fever and dog heartworm is a big one. And of course, you've got encephalitic diseases as well. So again, the, the you know, reference is there and you're able to read more about it. Another very important uh, invasive species that is really well entrenched already is Aedes albopictus, um, first detected in 1985. It's expanded over the many years. It's a good competent vector for dengue and chikungunya and Zika and heartworm, and also uh, a bridge vector, meaning that it can also transmit West Nile, Triple E, not, very, not the most important you know, vector, but it is a possibility. They're active during the day, but we find here in New Orleans that they're crepuscular, so they're active at dawn and dusk as well. Now, the good thing here is that actually they prefer animal blood uh, instead of humans, um, but very important when it, in 2016 when it, you know, we were looking at this for Zika virus. It is Egypti mosquitoes, um, again, another very important one, very competent vector for yellow fever, dengue, chikungunya, Zika, Lots of things they like to prefer on, uh, to feed on humans. So that's a problem. We're actually going to be doing some blood meal analyses on some females, um, on um, Aedes aegypti females that have blood fed. And so we're going to look to see what they have been feeding on. Is it dog, cat, human, a rat? We'll have a much better idea. 
So again, crepuscular as well, they're in and around our environment and they lay their eggs in all kinds of containers, especially little tiny ones. Um, also good, you can see all the little black specks, those are their eggs that they've stuck to the side of that container. And really important, there are lots of different maps. You can go online. This actually happens to be a little bit old. I was looking for the 2020 uh, map, I couldn't find it. Um, but these are locations that have been recorded. I'm sure it's expanded since. Uh, California looks like it's doing a great job with uh, records and they have lists and lists and lists of the different counties of where it's been found. So congratulations to them for doing that. Don't forget a little bit of history here, okay? New Orleans, 1905, that was the last outbreak of yellow fever that occurred um, here in the, the nation. One in 12 New Orleanians in 1853 had died of yellow fever. So that's pretty scary. And if for the folks that have been here, please go visit Lafayette um, Cemetery One um, because unfortunately it's so sad to see, but you have told, you have an entire, more than one entire mausoleum where it, almost the entire family is buried and they all died of yellow fever. So pretty sad situation. And of course we've got the vector Aedes aegypti. So it's really important for us to always keep looking forward and outside the US um, because there's a possibility that somebody will come in from let's say Brazil or another endemic region, um, not know they have it and infect our mosquitoes. And, th and there you go with local transmission. So what are vectors? Okay, vectors are organisms that can transmit disease causing bacteria, viruses, parasites from one animal to the other. And so vectors can come in all kinds of forms from mammals to bugs to you know insects to spiders and uh, birds and pigs and all kinds of things. But what we're really talking about here are arthropod borne disease, right? So these are associated with insects and arachnids and crustaceans. And so arthropod, right? Arthropod borne virus and arbovirus, a ticks as well as a really big one, midges, another one. So there's a whole lot of different ones. Now, very specifically our mosquito borne disease, right? So it's really only applying to mosquitoes. It's gonna exclude some of those other arthropods. So you'll, you'll see mosquito borne disease on a very regular basis. So there are lots of different diseases um, that are mosquito borne, right? So here in our state of Louisiana, we've got a lot of them that we need to worry about. So St. Louis, St. Louis encephalitis and Eastern equine, of course, the big one that is just completely endemic that shows up each year is West Nile virus. And Louisiana happens to be pretty hot for, for West Nile. Us in California, Texas, there's a few places that are really pretty hot. Um, dog heartworm, we're gonna talk about that today. And also one that people are talking more about is Jamestown Canyon virus. So we're gonna talk about it. Globally, malaria and dengue are just devastating um, to so many people. It causes a tremendous amount of death uh, and suffering. Uh, believe it or not, Zika is still around. My family happens to be from Brazil. And you know, so I try to keep a pulse on what's going on and Zika virus has not gone away. It's gone away from the news, but it is there. Chikungunya as well. Yellow fever um, has come back um, in some locations as well. So we need to be very careful. And then we're, depending on where you are in the US, you're gonna have other encephalitic diseases. Um, West Nile, of course, is throughout the States and then dog heartworm. So again, as I mentioned, very devastating um, with Zika all the way to this, um, you know, these nematode diseases. Um, so very, very important, but 17% of all infectious disease, um, you, you know, are, was where it's accounted with. And this is what the WHO has estimated. And so we're looking at over 700,000 deaths a year that are associated uh, with, with these different pathogens. That's really a lot. So with West Nile virus, right? And this is the one I'm gonna mostly talk about because it is important for everybody that is here. And so this happens to be a bird mosquito virus cycle, okay? So the bird, the mosquitoes feed on the bird and the cycle keeps going round and around. It's just that every once in a while, right? We happen to be outside hanging out in our backyard at night and here comes that Culex mosquito and how here we are, and we're a dead end host. So we're not gonna be replicating that virus and I'll talk about it here in a second. Another dead end host are horses. Now, West Nile is devastating for horses. 
Now, the good thing is that they actually have vaccines for horses. And so people need to make sure they get their horses vaccinated. And every once in a while, you know, we have horses that die here um, in parts of Louisiana, and it's usually because it weren't vaccinated. So again, that natural host, right? So that's the, the, the bird here in this case, the viremia. So the amount of virus is high enough uh, for that female mosquito uh, to infect other hosts. So it, it'll go and that cycle keeps on rolling. Now, when it comes to the dead end hosts, yes, we can get that virus in ourselves, but we're not going to replicate it enough that let's say another mosquito comes, it's not gonna pick up enough to then go infect somebody else. So West Nile is very common in the US. Um, it does affect the central nervous system. Most of the cases are asymptomatic. You're never gonna know you had it, right? But 20% will have that flu-like symptom um, and malaise and not feeling well and fever, you know, so some of those generic symptoms. Um, and unfortunately, a smaller percentage, about a half to 1% can have very severe cases, often the neuroinvasive form. So that's gonna cause encephalitis or meningitis. And so look, there are cases where people have become infected and they can't even uh, balance their checkbook anymore. For example, they have these lifelong horrible symptoms and in a very rare cases, but it does happen, um, you do have some mortality. So it's usually people with some sort of pre-existing condition and it's, you know, West Nile that unfortunately, you know, causes the fatality. So just to give you an idea, 2020, 35 states reported human neuroinvasive disease cases. This changes every year. So I really suggest that you can go to the CDC, Arbonet, all that information is there. I'm just going to touch on Triple E. Uh, because this happened, I think it was last year, quite a few cases. Um, you've got vectors here, your 80 species, Coclotidia, Perturbans, Culocida, Melanora. So they're just, they're different vectors. Um, it's triple E. And that cycle is between Culocida and the birds. Okay, so it keeps going around and around. And then in the case of a bridge vector, right? So that mosquito is going to go bite another uh, animal. In this case, it would be horses and humans that also are dead end hosts that can have symptoms. It's not very common, you know, it's relatively low. We're going to talk a little bit about that. Um, but this is what happened in 2020. These were the cases you can see here um, in the green. Uh, there was an outbreak on the East Coast and also in um, the Great Lakes area. I remember seeing that on the news. So with Eastern equine, about 5% of the people, so it's not that many, okay, out of, out of everyone who gets infected or at least uh, bit and infected are going to have some sort of clinical case, but 30% of those 5% uh, have mortality. So it's pretty serious. So individuals above 50 and below 15, so it's sort of the edges, right, of our population are at the highest risk for developing severe disease. Um, and again, it's a big issue uh, for horses, uh, but there is a vaccine available and folks need to get their horses vaccinated. So there are lots of different ones, and this is just a quick table, and I believe you'll get this later um, in the presentation, but it gives you an idea of the disease, the type of virus it is, or in this particular case with the heartworm, it's a nematode, it's a roundworm, right? Um, and where it can be found, some of the symptoms, severity, and again, most of these are low incidence that you're going to present in symptoms, but in some cases when you do present, it's not so great. So um, with that. All right, so with dog heartworm, look, here in our region, you can look at the Southeast region. Um, you must prophylactically um, you know, treat your dogs because otherwise it will um, get heartworm. I mean, it's just, and it's terrible. So. If you've ever seen online those photographs, uh, nematodes, they reproduce and eventually they end up in the heart of the dog and it really fills it up and it really blocks uh, blood pumping and it causes a lot of different issues. And so you're able to treat the dog after they're infected, but you have to keep them almost confined because you don't want the nematodes to die and um, get in its circulatory system. So just do the prophylactic work. It's a lot better for everybody. 
One that's been um, really out there and a more emphasis being placed on it is Jamestown, Jamestown Canyon virus. I know we had only one case here in Louisiana, but look at Minnesota and Wisconsin, right? So these are high numbers, I would say, uh, for Jamestown and the vectors here, 80s, Anopheles, Culicida, um, pretty important. And actually the white-tailed deer is the primary uh, reservoir for this. So I was just on a meeting two days ago with CDC and some other folks from NACHO, and they're really pushing to do better surveillance at the state and local level so we can have a much better idea of what is going on. So again, cases are, lots of cases are asymptomatic, um, very rare to have death, but you know, in some cases people do get hospitalized, hospitalized that are um, symptomatic. Um, same sort of symptoms, fever, fatigue, cough, running nose, sore throat, sounds kind of familiar, right? Uh, but those severe symptoms can cause meningitis, which is um, infection of the membranes around the brain and the spinal cord, or encephalitis, which is infection of the brain. So pretty important. Interesting here is you can have um, um, transovarial transmission. So that's when the virus infects the, the female. Um, you know, you can essentially, she can lay the eggs and that virus is gonna be transmitting through the eggs. So I know I get this question all the time, right? Can, can mosquitoes transmit other things, maybe like hepatitis or HIV. Um, so those are our questions that come up all the time. And actually mosquitoes do not regurgitate blood. So they're not, um, they're gonna inject saliva, but you know, some of these viruses are actually, you know, they have to have very specific environments to survive, um, you know, and especially with HIV here, the target uh, locations, on um, that particular virus are not gonna be present in the mosquito so that they're not really going to survive, you know, outside that human. And then also some of these are very uh, fragile. So they're gonna have very specific conditions um, in order for them to survive outside of their host. So we don't see that, which is really great. There's a couple of papers that actually talk about that. So it'd be interesting. There was a paper also, um, another question, especially early on with COVID-19 that came out, will mosquitoes, midges transmit COVID-19? You know, we're even looking in rats with this. And actually for both rats and a Norway rat and for mosquitoes and midges, the answer is no, uh, they don't. And the paper just came out, it's a 2021 you can see here, uh, but the results bottom line here is that biting insects, um, they did not see that they would actually, COVID-19 you know, COVID would replicate. Um, so they're really not biological vectors um, for, for COVID-19. Mosquitoes are not biological vectors, which is, Great, right? Uh, very important. So as we continue on here for mosquito management, very important for us to all do source reduction, community prevention, and there's a place for our pest management professionals, especially because you're in everyone's yards, you know, really, really take that opportunity to educate your folks. And actually, when you're doing any kind of treatment, or if you plan on doing treatment, you need to do source reduction anyway. Uh, prior. So that's removing those tires and look at the gutters and all the containers, make sure everything, that water is removed. Now, remember how I told you how the eggs of 80s stick onto things? Well, this is the perfect example, I think. It's a, a bird bath. So you need to make sure to teach your homeowners and your customers to make sure that when they dump the water, they're actually scrubbing the inside or the container so that it'll loosen, remove those eggs that are stuck. I actually like to use a bleach solution um, just to kill everything that's in there. And then you scrub as well, because otherwise, if you dump the water out and then fill it up with water, guess what's gonna happen? Those mosquito eggs are going to hatch. So important to do that. Also home prevention, repair your screens and windows. Don't leave the doors open. Uh, it sounds like I'm you know, talking about mosquitoes, but it's the same thing for rodents and other pests. Uh, use air conditioning when possible, but not everybody has air conditioning. So fans are good. And look, we get lots of people calling about one or two mosquitoes inside their house. So, you know, obviously kill them. They're annoying, right? Especially at night, but make sure that they're, you know, you do remove them so they're not biting you in the middle of the night. 
Um, and again, we're going to use insecticides, you know, we do as well, but just make sure that you're using everything according to the label. And those uh, dark resting spots, um, humid places under sink, furniture, et cetera, et cetera, all those places are checked. When it comes to mosquito control, we have a really great option, right, for biological control. Not every pest does, but fish work great. They're mosquito fish. Now, the important part of mosquito fish is you just can't go buy from your local pet store and put it in a natural body of water. Cannot do that. You have to really look with your check with your local wildlife and fisheries folks. Um, you can check with the universities to see what species are allowed. But these are you're able to use. Um, this happens to be Gambusia affinis, but they're being placed into um, swimming pools that might not be functioning or a, a fountain, um, sugar kettles around here. So it's these closed um, water containers or little water bodies um, so that they're not going into the na regular natural system. But they work well and, um, you know, they reproduce and they're just voracious little creatures. All right, so let's get to the good stuff now, right? So let's talk a little bit about insecticides and we're gonna talk about resistance testing and uh, public education. And so when it comes to chemical control, right, there's was sort of my thinking is that you're gonna stop them at the source, larvicide when you can, kill the ones that remain. So those are the ones that are flying around. We're gonna erect barriers, um, some of these residual treatments, and then also the use of repellents. And when it comes to mosquito control, it's all on the table. Um, so one alone usually doesn't do the job. You have to do just different combinations for what is appropriate. And there are lots of different types of larvicides out there from oils to films that are going to break that surface tension. Um, and also some bacterial larvicides and insect growth re regulators such as uh, pyroproxen or even methoprene. And in this photograph, you can see that actually we used an oil here and you can see that sheen um, that is on that water, but we had to treat all of those tires before getting them transported because they were all full of mosquito larvae. There are a lot of different formulations and lots of equipment to use. And so we have an airboat, right? We have an airplane. So, um, but also what I didn't show here is a helicopter. And those are usually the, your, your county and your parish, your large programs that are doing it. Um, but you can see a little dunk um, you can educate your homeowners or that's something that you can do as well. Um, you can actually use backpack sprayers, wands, hand application, B and, little B&Gs. There's all kinds of things. And in fact, in some cases, there's also adulticides that are, are formulated with larvicides. So it's a combination. So you do find a lot of different formulations out there. Now, when it comes to adulticiding, um, this happens to be our airplane and our spray truck, right? Um, but you can do a space spray. So those are the aerial adult deciding and um, backpacks. And so you're spraying sort of a big area. You've got residual sprays that are going to go on those resting space or locations, such as walls, but really vegetation. And then also indoor residual spraying, which we don't do uh, hardly at all in the U.S., but for some of these locations around the world where we, they don't have screens and uh, mosquitoes rest inside, it's a common uh, use uh, of these uh, adulticides. There are a lot of variables to consider when you are making the decision to use an adulticide or larvicide for that matter. So you're looking at your nuisance and your also medically important mosquitoes. Ooh, are they there? What's going on, right? Um, your vector species, the numbers and the areas. Um, and this is something we do all the time. The time of the year is very important, especially if you've got that seasonality. What's the extent of the problems or issues that you're having? And um, that's why that inspection is very important, not only at that property, but maybe looking around to have a better lay you know, of the land of what's going on. You're looking at temperature. Um, for us, especially in the summertime, we, we could have inversions um, when we're um, spraying by airplane or by truck. You have to look at wind speed because you want to minimize your wind, your drift, and also looking at the rain. 
So you're not gonna spray a, a residual on vegetation and then 30 minutes later, you have a deluge of rain. So you really have to keep you know, on the pulse of what's going on. So targeting mosquitoes with barrier applications, this is something that we really, especially in 2016 and 17, started like, I would say 15, 16 and 17, we started really exploring the use and doing trials uh, in New Orleans and primarily with uh, Lambda Cyhalothrin and Bifenthrin. Those I think are the two big products or active ingredients that are out there. There are some studies um, out there already showing the efficacy and how you test uh, for residual activity. But especially with us, with having Aedes aegypti and Aedes allopictus, which are very local type mosquitoes, um, and they're very good at uh, competent vectors for Zika and chikungunya, because we had travel cases, this is one of the tools that we incorporated into our areas around travel cases. So not only we were using our plane and our, our trucks, but we were also using residuals to really throw everything we had at those travel cases to make sure that they did not um, have cause local transmission, which we did not. Um, in backyard treatments, this is actually just one of our very lush yards, right? It's a perfect environment here. Um, but, you know, it's really getting in to that vegetation underneath the leaves um, in those particular areas so that you can see that there were a lot of um, locations where those mosquitoes uh, could rest. So we also use ULV, right, ultra low volume uh, formulations to do backyard treatments, but you can also use portable mist blowers and that's become a lot more common uh, in the industry. Those are much larger droplets um, as compared to the ULV. Uh, ULV typically are not going to have that residual, um, you know, properties, whereas you would with your mist blowers and your residual type treatments. Again, you know, looking at your backpack misters, um, misting systems are also out there um, that will leave some sort of residual treatment. That's, it was very common. I don't think it's quite as common as, as it used to be, uh, but you have to really look at that property and look at the label of what it allows for. Um, areas that are protected by rain, under houses, underside of leaves, but again, read the label um, for when you can use it and where. However, there are some things with all of them is do not apply to water. These are pyrethroids and pyrethroids can be very toxic to fish. So pretty important. And then also be very cognizant of your fruit trees and your vegetable gardens, your different edibles, your, your herbs that are out there. And again, please don't spray the flowers because of those pollinators. And we're gonna talk about that here. And we have to be very mindful right, of non-target effects. Um, so we want to protect our bees, our butterflies, and so be very careful about when you're spraying and where. One, it's the label, it's the law, you have to follow your label and there's usually provisions for non-targets. And again, we want to be respectful and mindful of our industry. Um, if someone, uh, a few years ago, there was a district that actually had a huge bee kill and it makes everybody look bad, right? So we want our tools to be available. We don't have a ton of tools for, as insecticides for mosquito control. So we want to preserve all of what we have. Um, also safety and the liability. Nobody wants to be replacing hives. Um, it's just poor product stewardship and unprofessional when we're not really paying attention. And we have to be very environmentally mindful um, which is always a great idea. Our bees need to be protected. So they're very economic, um, very important economically, social insects. Um, there are a lot of uh, hives, you know, backyard folks that have hives. Um, and again, they're just really very beautiful. People love bees. So again, be very careful of where and how you're using these products. Avoid that drift. Um, you may have to come back on a day um, if it's not the right condition, because again, some of these animals are very, very um, susceptible. I'm gonna roll through real, real, real quick. And one of the things we wanna make sure is really to be careful about uh, insecticide resistance, not really going into a, a ton of it here um, because our, the local folks normally, companies wouldn't necessarily be doing this, but we do it on a greater scale um, to look at um, resistance and where it may be issues because we want to prevent resistance issues so that our, our chemicals, our, our larvicide or adulticides are effective and um, available. 
that public education is really super critical. I want everybody, you know, everybody really has an opportunity to do outreach, understand your audience. Social media has been super interesting. And look, it's been a learning process, especially with COVID-19 and everything going digital. Uh, make sure you communicate and let your staff understand and know what you're really doing and how with the biology and the control. And again, always talk to people, it doesn't matter who it is about you know, mosquito control, vector control. You're going to have multiple audiences like we do. We're gonna to have to reach those audiences because not everybody is going to be tech savvy. And there are a zillion types of flyers out there. Just make sure that you're targeting those flyers to your audience. And so, um, you know, that people can relate, which I think is important. Of course, this is pre-COVID photos. Oh, I miss those days, right? <laughs> I cannot wait. Um, but, you know, look, it's been an evolving process. And so there's lots of different opportunities for folks, just like you're sitting here today, um, is learning something uh, about what we do in New Orleans with mosquito control. But there's lots of different opportunities. I'm actually finding that there are even more and a lot of these are very accessible. Fears, all these things are also places, you know, I think mosquito control is always a big hit when it comes to it because people are looking at those little biological creatures. And again, do not forget, right, about our rain barrels and other things that are, people are seeing. So take those opportunities to please educate folks properly on rain barrels. And you can see this little arrow right here. So look at this problem. It looks great, right? Um, but this, there's a dip in this pipe. And these corrugated pipes are a huge issue when it comes to Aedes albopictus and Aedes aegypti mosquitoes because all these little locations are where water can um, accumulate. Again, teach your customers 10 minutes a week. That's all we need, right? Once a week um, to go and go through their yard and turn over containers. And also don't forget to train your staff about protecting themselves. Um, we talk about this all the time, using repellents and you know long sleeves, and we don't want your folks to get sick as well. Again, a lot of different resources. I believe um, you know PCT folks will be sending out some links, but there are a ton of resources for everyone on this call. You just need to go and find them locally, uh, but there's also national associations um, that you can tap into. So just as a last slide summary here, is look, mosquito control is pretty complicated when it comes to it. And we really have to keep a lot of, uh, I would say balls you know, in the air at one time. But our goal here really is to protect our population of, of people, animals. Um, you know, There's definitely economic impacts when it comes to mosquito control. We, as a big program, would be doing a lot of that surveillance, but you can tap into that information now at your state and the national level at CDC. Um, and again, when you're doing mosquito control, if you're, if you're thinking of doing it, you need to really think about equipment and supplies and training your personnel. And again, continue to work on education and product stewardship is key because we want all of our products um, to survive so we have it available. Um, you can follow us on at um, NOLA Mosquito. We actually did a pest education webinar. It was a four-part series. Um, please let us know, education at NOLA.gov. We're going to be re-airing this. And we're also going to, we're actually revamping our website now. Um, and we're going to be posting all those videos. So um, here's my information, and I appreciate your time today. Thank you. Claudia, fantastic job. Uh, really great, uh, comprehensive overview of the mosquitoes from a uh, really uh, approach to the topic from a lot of different angles and a lot of great information uh, shared with our, our listeners. Um, we did get uh, some questions that came in through our Q&A box. Um, like I mentioned before, though, we're going to hold off on those until the, until the, uh, till the end of the conference, until we, uh, till we hear from Nikki. Um, and let's see, the other question we got, uh, some folks had asked us about um, getting a copy of the presentation. And so we are recording this. And um, as an attendee, you'll receive a link that includes a copy of uh, the presentation uh, recording. And also, as Claudia had mentioned throughout her presentation, um, she had mentioned some, some links and some, some documents. 
we're going to also send those to you in that follow-up email with the link. So if you missed any of that, uh, look for those in a follow-up email. And also, we're also posting those in the chat box too, so you can look for them there. But again, if you if you miss them there, we'll uh, we'll send all that stuff in a, in a follow-up email. All right. So with that, um, we're going to move on to the next uh, part of our presentation. And we're really looking forward to hearing from Nikki Gallagher and a little bit about Nikki. Um, she is the technical services manager of professional pest management in the Midwest and Northeast for Syngenta. And again, Syngenta is our sponsor and we, we really thank them for, for sponsoring this and bring this to all of our, our listeners. And uh, Nikki's been, she has 19 years of industry experience and this includes time spent as a staff research associate in the entomology department at Ohio State University and as a development and technical representative for DuPont Professional Pest. And in her current role with Syngenta, uh, Nikki is responsible for all phases of field testing and technical support within her region and coordinates uh, numerous research programs with university researchers and cooperators. And uh, Nikki holds an MS and PhD from Ohio State University. So with that, we'll turn things over to Nikki. Thank you so much, Brad, and thank you to all of our attendees for joining us today. And Dr. Regal, thank you so much for that excellent presentation. And I always learn something new when I listen to you. And I just really appreciate your knowledge and your passion in sharing that with us. So sticking with today's theme, it's about um, bringing added value to your business, right? So I wanna share some of the work and the research that we're conducting at Syngenta. Um, to help be, boost your mosquito program, um, whether it's a current program or whether you're considering entering um, the mosquito business. Now, my presentation is gonna be focused on residential mosquito control or you know, what we call mosquito barrier applications. And um, we have numerous programs that we have put together at Syngenta. And one of those exam examples is our Mosquito Secure Choice Assurance Program. So these programs are protocols that we have gone out into the field and tested across the country uh, with university and industry technical experts to make sure that they're comprehensively tested and that we can provide um, the best recommendations along with the best management practices to ensure that you're gonna have the proven performance that we stand behind um, in these programs. So for example, with the Mosquito program, we have a 30-day program or we have a 60-day program. And if you follow our program and use the products and recommendations um, in that protocol, uh, so for 60 days, it's one application of our products every 60 days. If you have to go back and do a retreatment in that 60 day period, we will give you the product required to do that retreatment because we um, can guarantee that level of control within that 60 day period. And what's also an added value to these programs is it's gonna also free up tech te technician time. So you've got this extended cycle of one application every 60 days. So now you have added time for you or your technician that you can do other applications um, or spend time on other parts of your business. So whether it's you know mosqu mosquitoes, scorpions, cockroaches, you can check out um, these assurance programs um, on our website at syngentapmp.com forward slash secure choice. Now, today's focus is on mosquitoes um, and the backbone of our mosquito program, um, just uh, as it is our general perimeter program and, and some of our other public health pests is our Lambda Psi Halothrin product, uh, which is called Demand CS. Um, now, Demand CS has been on the marketplace for 20 years but it has a excellent reputation. It is a legacy product. And I did wanna spend just a quick moment sharing some of the technology behind Demand CS because I think it's important because it's what has made Demand CS a staple in our industry and is a testament to how well this product succeeds out in the field. And it's really all behind the formulation of Demand CS. It contains an excellent active ingredient containing Lambda Psi Halothrin, which has um, an excellent relative activity level, only requires small amount of active ingredient. But the other part, 
to a good product, right, is the formulation. So our ICAP technology um, protects this active ingredient. So the microcaps are double walled. It's a dual walled microcap. So your inner wall is a spongy layer that actually helps the release rate or regulates the release rate of lambda cyhalothrin. While the outer wall is our protective shell that's gonna protect it from those harsh environments, from high heat, high pH. So demand was formulated to hold up in a greasy kitchen, but also hold up just as well in that hot Arizona summer. And the larger microcaps are gonna have stronger links between the inner wall and outer wall. And that's what's gonna give you that longer residual up to 90 days. Our smaller microcaps have weaker walls, but that's what we want with a smaller microcap. So you get that nice, fast and immediate knockdown. So when you do a mosquito application, you've got immediate control after you've applied, but you're also getting long lasting residual. So you can walk away from the site knowing that your customers are being protected. Um, as you can see on the pictures on the left, you've got um, the microcaps of different sizes providing excellent coverage of the surface. You've got the cross section of a microcap and you can see the inner spongy wall um, inside the microcap. And then on the bottom picture, we have actually that's a picture of a cockroach, but you can see a single microcap has attached to the cockroach. So our microcaps stick readily to the insect cuticle. Um, so the waxy layer is actually very attractive to the insect, I'm sorry, to the Demancius microcaps. They stick to the insect and the walls of the microcap slowly begin to release the active ingredient. And you can actually see the halo of lambda cyhalothrin beginning to be released. It's also a water-based formulation. So you've got the advantages of being non-staining as well as low odor. Now, the Demand CS formulation was never patented. Um, so it's a recipe that Syngenta has. So our ICAP technology remains with Syngenta, it'll never be released. Um, and when we compare our Demand CS microcap, which you can see highlighted in blue, and we compare that to other uh, microcaps or generics on the market, we do see some really large differences. So these are microscopic images and we're looking um, closer and closer at these microcaps, um, you know, a couple of thousand times over. So we can just see an individual microcap. And when you put these various microcaps under high heat, UV light, high pressure, Demand CS remains intact while others begin to collapse or never truly had a microcap to begin with, uh, suggesting that the, these other products are just single walled or again, never had a microcap to begin with and are not going to provide the long lasting residual. Now, Demand CS, like I mentioned, has been on the marketplace for about 20 years and is still a market leader. And it has been tested and published upon for numerous insects. Um, uh, but this is just an example on this particular side of a more recent publication. So when we put our secure choice protocols together, like I mentioned, we take it out into the field and we test them and determine, you know, which, which is the best combination of products or how to use them, what's the best equipment to use. This example is um, a publication that came through multiple years of testing our products around mosquito barrier applications. It was a quite intensive study. Um, it was conducted by mosquito experts at Virginia Tech University and was published in the Journal of American Mosquito Control. And as you can see from the title, it looked at, you know, does plant species make a difference? Because think about the backyard, right? There's plants that have really waxy leaves, some have really hairy leaves. And we also looked at exposure time of the mosquito as well as um, evaluating different formulations. And thankfully, plant species did not really seem to make a difference in the performance of Demand CS. But what they did find in this study is Demand CS remained very resistant to envir environmental degradation and it did outperform other treatments that was included in this study and that the micro capped technology is really behind that. And that's what's providing the active, 
protecting the active ingredient. And because of that, the, fre the frequency of your reapplications can be reduced. Again, so you can go out about once every 60 days, which results in benefits for both the operator and the environment. Now, with our mosquitoes, we typically say once every 60 days tops, and that's because plants will grow, right? If it's a man-made surface, we say about once every 90 days, but with plants, they grow within 60 days period, you could have new fresh leaves that have grown. So that would be an untreated surface that the mosquito could rest on. So this is just a quick snap snapshot of some of that work that was published uh, by Virginia Tech. They did compare Demand CS to other pyrethroids on the marketplace. They treated plants that were exposed to real world conditions. Um, these plants were also treated with backpack mist blowers like you would do in a real world application. So those leaves that were treated were taken back to the lab. Um, Asian tiger mosquito, female mosquitoes were exposed to those leaves and mortality was monitored. So on the left, left hand side, you can see the results of the mosquito mortality of Demand CS compared to a bifenthrin product. The light blue represents Demand CS that you can see here. Um, our control is the very dark blue line. So we had very minimal mortality in our controls. So Demand CS and the bifenthrin product were fairly similar, aged out to two weeks. But at that point, there were some significant differences. Um, and what we're suggesting here is that the bifenthrin was likely degrading after two weeks, you might have to go back and do a reapplication. But with the Demand CS application, it continued to cause high mortality levels in the mosquitoes, again, with just a brief five minute exposure, and even leaves aged out to eight weeks. Um, we had an average over this study of about 88% control. Now that same data set was compared to a Delta Methrin product. So again, you see the same data for Demand CS over the eight week period. Um, with the Delta Methrin product, um, this five minute exposure did not cause mortality uh, much higher than about 35%. And that did vary across the study period, um, but over the entire eight week period, that mortality level did not get much higher than 35%, uh, suggesting a five minute exposure period was not enough time for a mosquito to pick up a lethal dose. So we know this, this product, Demand CS, can hold up very well um, in tough, challenging environments, but our program is also a multi-pronged approach, just like Dr. Regal mentioned, right? We have to use all of our different tools. So if we've got, um, standing water, you know, containers holding water. We're going to use insect growth regulators um, such as, as Altacid that contains methoprene or BTI dunks or BTI uh, briquettes. We can also include um, pyroproxifen based insect growth regulators. So Syngenta's example of that is Archer insect growth regulator. And that can actually be tank mixed into your backpack mist blower with your adulticide like Demand CS. So this is just a way to enhance your backyard application. So Archer contains pyroproxifen. It's a juvenile hormone mimic. Um, so it effectively interrupts the life cycle and it's also gonna provide additional residual control. Um, there's been many studies to show that mosquitoes can also transfer pyroproxifen to their uh, breeding sites. And this is also gonna be helpful to get an insect growth regulator into those hard to reach or cryptic breeding sites. And Archer is you know, uh, very photostable. It's gonna hold up again in those tough environments and it's gonna provide an additional layer of control. And that's gonna be really valuable, especially when we're gonna do one application every 60 days and use that tank mix of Demand CS with the insect growth regulator. And Archer does hold up well and provide a long lasting residual. Um, we had different types of containers um, that were treated with Archer Insect Growth Regulator. We had plastic plant sources as well as clay plant sources, prime areas that are container mosquito, uh, container breeding mosquitoes uh, will like to use. So here we had the plastic containers and the clay containers. They were treated just to the point of runoff with Archer. They remained out in the field for up to eight weeks. 
and they were brought into the lab and our mosquito researchers at Virginia Tech tried to um, develop mosquitoes from the larval stage in these containers, just like they would um, when they're um, breeding mosquitoes for other trials. And what they found is that single application of Archer prevented 100% of adult emergence for at least eight weeks. So on the left, you're looking at the emergence rate for the clay sources and the emergence rate for the plastic sources on the right. You're only seeing gray bars, which represents our controls, those that were just treated with water. So our mosquitoes successfully emerged into adults when it was just treated with water. But the blue bars, which are in blue, represent our archer treated um, sources are at zero. So you actually can't even see those bars because no mosquitoes turned into adults. And that was effective even out to eight weeks. I also wanted to share a quick slide actually from Dr. Regal's work um, with her team down in New Orleans. And um, this is simulating if a couple of droplets from your backpack mist blower went into a cryptic breeding site. So let's say, for example, a tree hole, you hit that with a couple of droplets, and then you had very small quantities of these insecticides in this tree hole or a bromeliad. And the levels that were used in this study were about a hundred fold below label rate. So tiny quantities of active ingredient. Um, in containers that contained Demensias, it was about six parts per million. And in containers that contained Archer or IGR had one parts per million. The different colored lines just represent the three different mosquito species that were tested and uh, the larvae and the pupae of these mosquitoes were placed in the containers. And um, we were able to achieve 80 to 100% um, mortality with both of these products. Um, as we would expect with the insect growth regulator, uh, we just extended the time for the mosquito development that um, they either just continue to remain as pupae, or if they tried to become adults, they couldn't develop properly and got caught in that malt and eventually died. So this gives us a really good idea of the strong residual activity of these products that even very, very small quantities can be effective. And actually when they're combined together, we get a synergistic effect and our results are enhanced. Now, just like Dr. Regal mentioned, our best management practices are really important. So, you know, make sure that you are fully educated, you have the appropriate license for doing mosquito applications, and you know where your adulticides should be going, you know where your larvicides should be going. And um, you know, if you have that tank mix of a residual pyrethroid and a larvicide, make sure you know where those can go as well, right? So um, if your tank mix contains the pyrethroid, we don't want to be applying that in bodies of water unless it's a non-permanent source of water, such as a tree hole or a bromeliad. Now, just a few tips and tricks on the application. Um, you know, think of these cockroaches, our container breeding cockroaches, like German cockroaches. They like to be around humans. They like dark, shady areas that are humid. Um, that are going to be protected from wind and sunlight. So we're going to treat the vegetation that meets all those parameters because they want to um, be on the underside of the leaf in dense vegetation where they're more protected. So vegetation in the backyard is a key resting site for these mosquitoes, but it can be other shaded areas as well. So like underneath decks or other raised stru structures. Um, I do want to you know, make the important point that we're not going to be treating open grass areas. Our mosquitoes are not going to be hanging out on nicely maintained lawns. And we don't want to treat flowering plants, you know, just like Dr. Regal mentioned. It's about product stewardship. And we also want to make sure we're protecting our non-target insects. Um, when you're using the equipment, and typically for backyard mosquito applications, we're talking about backpack misters. Make sure you're using this equipment appropriately and also be safe when you use it. Um, you know, be aware of your area. Don't trip on any items in the backyard. 
you know, make sure you did a really thorough inspection to begin with. Um, because if you trip um, while wearing this equipment, like you're walking backwards and not paying attention, it can be really painful and you could land in the hospital if you're not using this equipment properly. So again, here's just an example. This is a picture I took in two very different backyards. So the one on the right has all of this dense ground ivy and it's dark and shady and covered by invasive honeysuckle. That's an ideal place that we can treat for mosquitoes. Um, there's even a tree I can treat around the base of the tree. Um, on the left is a really nice maintained lawn, lots of open area. I'm not gonna treat that um, turf and grass because it's gonna be ineffective and we don't recommend that for mosquito control. Now, in our Secure Choice program, we have laid out all of these best management practices. So here are some examples of that. So step one is that very important pre-treatment inspection. Um, so you know, confirm children and pets are not present in the application area. Remove all child, uh, child or pet toys, pet water, food bowls. Have you made note of any flowering or edible plants in the area? Remove um, containers that can hold water. Use a larvicide in those immo immovable containers or non-draining areas. Um, observe any areas beyond your treatment zone to avoid chemical trespass. Be really careful about that, right? Make, check on the neighbor's side. Is there anything that you need to be aware of? And of course, make note of wind um, or potential mist and rainfall conditions. And you know, this is gonna be on, the, on many of your labels. So that's really important too. The customers have a role to play um, in, in this as well, the homeowners. You can provide a mosquito checklist for them. Say so they, they know areas that are or could potentially be breeding mosquitoes. And this is an example checklist that we're gonna be providing to you in this presentation today. PPE, make sure again, you're checking the label and you're wearing appropriate PPE. Um, also just be aware that certain states will supersede the label and might require additional PPE. So in California, um, a full respirator would be required, but that's not necessarily the case in many other states. Um, you're using a two cycle engine um, all day long. So I would recommend using ear, prote ear protection. Um, additional best, best practice management uh, sheets are also available. I think this is gonna be sent to you or is gonna be linked in the Dropbox. Um, and this is gonna go through all of those steps from pre-mixing the product all the way to the education part between you and your customer, right? Um, and that education and communication with the customer is really important. Um, I wish we could eliminate 100% of the mosquitoes, but that is not possible. And you need to have that conversation with the homeowner about what to expect. This is about mosquito reduction, not about mosquito elimination. Um, so here's your, your step three. You know, mixing the product is really important too. So let's use the 60 day program as an example, we recommend using a service container and we can actually supply those. You fill that container with one gallon of water, then you add your two ounces of Archer and agitate, then you add your 1.6 ounces of Demand CS and agitate, then you add your final one gallon of water and agitate. We don't recommend using wetting agents or stickers. Those are already built into our formulations. Adding other ones could actually um, damage um, the, the micro caps in our product and you're not gonna get the same type of residual that we stand behind. Now we recommend mixing in these service containers because that ensures a nice thorough mixture of the product. What we've seen happen if you mix directly in the tank, product can sink really quickly, it's heavier than water and you can have concentrated uh, material in your solution feed, feed tube. So the first part of the yard that you go to treat um, could be treated with highly concentrated material, which nobody wants. Uh, it's not good for the plants and it's not good um, for our industry. We wanna make sure this, this is thoroughly mixed in the service container and then apply it into the tank. And of course, you'd wanna make sure that these are labeled according to your state regulations if they can be used in your state. 
That step four is about the application. So uh, I'm mostly familiar with steel backpack mist blowers. Um, to get the best application, we recommend full throttle and use a nozzle setting of about three to four, which is the mid range. And for most other models, you're going for that mid range. Um, typically treating vegetation of about 10 feet and below. That's where most of our mosquitoes in the 80s uh, genus are resting. Stand close to the vegetation. Don't stand more than two to three to three feet away and rotate that nozzle in a circular pattern. That circular pattern is going to create a vortex and it's going to help those leaves move around and get the product on the underside of the leaf. So think what Think about waxing a car or pretend you're waxing a car when you're using those circular motions. Um, again, treating all vegetation or raised structures where it's shady and dark. Um, we tend to recommend you move in a sideways motion um, because it's the safest. If you walk forward, you're gonna walk into your treatment. If you walk backwards, you might trip and have a horrible accident. And of course, you know, always make sure you're following the label of the product that you're using. And it is really important to understand the equipment that you're using because that will determine how well um, your application is. You wanna get the product and appropriate amounts of products to these uh, resting sites. So um, this is the, the steel and this is the meter setting that I said you typically put about three or four. And I wanna show you the difference on those settings. So I put, um, some water sensitive cards into a forsythia bush that was non flowering. They turn blue. They go from yellow to blue when anything moist hits them. So, on that lowest setting, I hardly had any coverage. I'm probably going to have to go back and do a retreatment. That meter setting three, I got really nice coverage. Depending on the product and the rate I used, I'm going to be coming back maybe uh, in, in a month, maybe in 60 days. So again, inside and outside of the foliage, backside of the bushes, I tend to start close to the house first and then make my way to the perimeter, treating foliage and other sites about eight to 10 feet and below. So that's as high as you go. And again, using a circular motion. Now I'm gonna wrap up my part of the presentation with uh, ways to save money because we all like to save money, right? So this is our rebate program. Pest Partners 365. Um, I did want to mention that the qualification period is ending at the end of the month. So April 30th is the qualification period uh, ending point. Um, so you should still have time to join. Um, if you are able to achieve a base rate of at least $200, you automatically become a member and you can purchase a wide variety of Syngenta products um, to become a Pest Partners 365 member. It's a fantastic way to save money on all kinds of Syngenta products. And you can see on the chart below, the, you know, the, the more you spend, the, the more you um, earn in savings, right? So just sticking with mosquitoes as our example, um, you know, we have this master shipper of Demand CS, which contains 24 one quart bottles. One master shipper gets you a $200 rebate. So then with just that one purchase, you are in the Pest Partners 365 program. Um, so with that 24 one quart bottles, um, that provides about 3,840 finished gallons of demand CS. And you also get summer um, term pays on this that uh, you have up until June 25th to pay. Another example is our tailored solution uh, for mosquitoes and fleas is our multi-pack. It contains two quart bottles of Demencias and five pint bottles of Archer, getting you 80 finished gallons of solution. Um, so you could get 10 of these and that would automatically get you a $200 rebate and you'd be in the program or you could mix and match, right? You don't have to buy 10 cases. You could buy two and, and buy bait and, and, and other products to get you to that level. And again, this would be um, an item that has summer pay options. If you'd like to learn more or get updates, um, sign up and text uh, Pest Partners 365 to 20103. And 
my last uh, new addition, and it's my new favorite tool, is actually our Syngenta Pest app. That is going to uh, provide you with your label, your SDS, and even a mixing calculator all in one app. It's absolutely fantastic. Um, text pest app to that same number. So 20103. And that is my last slide, Brad. My email is up there if anybody wants to follow up after today's presentation. And, and Brad, if we have time, um, I'd love to try and answer any questions with Dr. Regal. Hi, Nikki. Thanks for a terrific presentation and for that uh, wonderful overview of all the different uh, products that Syngenta, products and services and support that Syngenta offers. And uh, certainly encourage folks to visit the Syngenta website. And also, as I mentioned before, we'll be sending some of those that materials that uh, Nikki had mentioned in your presentation um, as part of the follow-up. So um, we are right at 3.30, um, but we'll go through maybe like 10 minutes worth of uh, Q&A and anything that we don't get through, we will, um, you know, Nikki and uh, Claudia will follow up with, but we'll try to go through a few questions right now and uh, it, it kind of go back and forth between uh, Claudia and Nikki. So uh, first question we had was, um, uh, Claudia, can, this is for Claudia. Claudia, can you mention which body odor lure you use and what species you target with it? Sure. So um, I think, uh, so we use the BG Sentinel traps. And so there's a, a body lure that you can purchase with it. So the two places that I think sell it is BioQuip, which I believe I put one, that information in the chat box. And also Adapco sells it as well. So um, it's, it matches that proprietary trap that's there. And so what we're really targeting are the 80s, it's 80s Albopictus and 80s Aegypti. Those are the two that we're targeting. And a question for Nikki. Um, Nikki, is demand CS effective for Culex? And if not, are there any kind of barrier sprays effective against Culex? And we had a couple folks ask about um, both demand and archer availability in Canada. Yeah, so quickly on the Canada, unfortunately, no, um, not, it's not available in Canada. And then the um, other question was about Culex. Yes, so it is effective on, on Culex as well. But really what we found, and there's multiple publications on this, and, and, and you can, can vary, right, so across the country, but with Culex are typically resting up high higher than 10 feet they're close to where the birds are nesting and we don't really want to treat that high you you know typically i say once you raise the nozzle of your backpack mister higher than your chin you could increase the chance for drift plus the product doesn't get up that high anyway it's not going to do a great job with the backpack mist blower getting the product up that high and and claudia i know will knows all the ins and outs of this but with culex the biggest bang for your buck in control is ulv applications at night to get Culex when they're on the wing. These um, barrier applications really do target 80s that rest below are active in the daytime. But if Culex comes along and, and sits on that treated surface, it will succumb to it. Um, but there are better ways to control Culex. Some of the flood water, this Claudia, so Nikki, just to add to that, some of the flood water mosquitoes as well are very susceptible, right, to some of these residual treatments and they're hanging around those maybe lights are attracted to on those porches and those, you know, also resting in that vegetation. So I think it has a, a wider range as well. Uh, Claudia, this one was for you. Um, can you, could you give us some insight and info on the bioengineered mosquitoes in Key West, Florida? What species are they? Are they male or female? And what is their main purpose? So I think what they're talking about, is it the, um, the engineered one. So I'm thinking what they're think is, is Oxytech is what they're looking for. Um, so those are, I believe those are 80s Egypti mosquitoes. And um, what I'll do here, because that's a complicated answer actually, is I will go ahead and give you, I'm going to send a link over that has some of that information. But what they do is they essentially are introducing, right, into, I don't think it's in Key West. Well, maybe it's in Key West. I don't remember. There's an island in Florida that I believe that they were introducing. So I'm not 100% sure when that introduction was. Um, but let me go ahead and pull it up and I'll send it to you in the link here in the chat in a second. So I'll have to look it up when that introduction was. But the target is 80s Egypti. 
Thank you. Uh, Nikki, a question was for you was um, when using the steel blower, do you recommend using one of the directional end caps that they come with? Yeah, you, you can. It's also the most uh, lost piece of equipment in mosquito control. So if you're going to use um, that end cap, I recommend zip tying it to your backpack uh, blower so you don't lose it. You know, when you put it into shrubbery, things like that, it, it'll get uh, kicked off and you lose it. But yeah, there are different baffles in there. The 360 is the one I tend to use the most often. Uh, Claudia, this one, we'll, we'll direct this one to you. Um, can SARS-CoV-2 be transmitted by mosquitoes? So yeah, that's that paper that referred to that. So the answer was right. no. Um, and make sure to check the chat because there's the whole publication um, that actually covers that particular topic. So just make sure, uh, I don't know who asked it, but um, you know, I would refer them to that publication and it looks like the answer is no. Uh, Nikki, a question was, um, are Syngenta programs available in Spanish? That is a very good question. I think that there's, it's probably likely. I will double check with our marketing. Uh, this question can go to either or both of you. Uh, what hour of the day is the best time to do a mosquito service based on your experience? Again, I think this is Claudia. So it look, it goes back to knowing the species of your mosquitoes and what you're trying to do. Right. So for us, we are doing these large areas of abatement. So most of our work is going to be after sundown or, you know, basically from dawn to dusk is when uh, we're, you know, the nighttime hours is when we're doing our work. You want to target the mosquito when it's most active. So for us, you know, if we're looking at West Nile as our target, it's usually the Southern house mosquito. That mosquito happens to be active mostly at night. And we're using, in our particular case, when we're doing these large areas, it's a ultra low volume spray. So these droplets are very tiny. And what you're trying to do is to get those little droplets, on, have them in pinch, hit the mosquito when they're flying around. So we try to target them when they're most active. Now, you know, you also have to be mindful of your pollinators, which are typically active during the day. So, you know, with a lot of these barrier treatments, you're, you're treating the vegetation, the mosquitoes are resting, hopefully inside. So you just really have to pay attention to where you're treating. So I think that it's not practical for if you have a bunch of accounts and you're, you know, you're not going to go at night every day and spray. So that's where these environmental conditions become very important. When you're looking at drift, you're looking at your flowers, you're looking at your edibles. Um, so that good product stewardship that I talked about is really key so that you can do these things, you know, you know during the day um, or very early morning is another option. Uh, Nikki, this one came in more towards the beginning of your, your presentation. Um, the question was, so did the efficacy of demand CS actually increase slightly after the sixth week? Um, on that one particular chart that, you know, we have variability, right? So when we do a study, it's a very robust study and we have lots of replication in, in doing that trial. So sometimes you end up with some variability. So that's what they might have seen, you know, so one leaf might have had a little bit more active ingredient on it or another leaf might have had a little bit more growth on it. Um, I think that's what they might have referenced where one week it was slightly higher uh, you know, versus another week. But in the grand scheme of thing, that difference was not huge from week to week um, where you know, there's going to be some degradation due to, to weather and things like that. Um, but after that eight week study with five minute exposure, it was about 88% mortality. Um, that, that study was more in depth and it's available through AMCA with a one hour exposure that did jump up to about 95% or so control and, and reduced some of that variability. Um, Nikki, this is another one for you is, are there any phyto, phytotoxic effects on ornamentals such as e.g. pothos or the money plant? Um, sure, yeah, very, yeah. Very, very good question, right? So 
Dementia S is also labeled for ornamentals. And before we ever register a product, we put it through a slew of tests to make sure none of that happens. And um, the only time I've ever seen that happen is when it was inappropriately mixed and a high concentration of material, whether it was Dementia S or Archer, basically went out fully concentrated onto a plant. So if you mix properly and use those service containers, you're not going to have any issues. So Nikki, I'll, I'll direct this one to you as well. It's just saying, you know, demand CS we use for German cockroach control for barrier treatments. Do we have this molecule? Does it have any translaminar movement to even no. reach? Okay. No, that, so that would be like a, a neonic type product. There's not going to be movement from foliage um, through the leaves, nor if you did a soil drench, there's not going to be any movement into the plant. Okay, I think we got to most of them. Some of these, some of them seem to be kind of repeating. So I think we kind of covered all of that. Um, but it just uh, again, any that we didn't get to, you know, we'll follow up with with Nikki and uh, with Claudia. So uh, I'll just kind of turn things over to you, uh, Nikki and Claudia, if you want to uh, give one final word. But uh, again, we want to thank Jennifer for, for, for sponsoring uh, our webinar. And uh, let me just kind of, before I, I turn it over to them for their final words, just give you a, a couple a couple notes here to pass along. Um, as we mentioned, there were a lot of really great links and other resources shared by Nikki and Claudia. We will send those again with the follow-up email that includes a recording of the uh, the event if uh, folks want to go back and watch it again and access those resources. Um, we'll have that on our website. And we'll also provide it to the, the folks at Syngenta. So again, we do want to thank Syngenta again. And I, I, again, before we leave, we'll just kind of turn things over to, uh, to Claudia and to Nikki for a couple final words. Yes, thank you so much again for the invitation. It was nice to actually chat with a lot, a lot of folks, you know, in the in the box there from from different meetings, and that I know. Uh, but again, look, really, look, mosquito control is super important. What everybody on this call does is very important. Um, but again, I really want to stress product stewardship is and also following that integrated mosquito management approach. So you really need to look at you know, your property and what you're trying to do holistically. So anyway, thanks so much again. Appreciate the invite. Yeah, just reiterating the same thing. Brad, thank you to you and PCT Magazine for the support. And Dr. Regal, thank you so much. I just absolutely love your, your passion and your support for our industry. Absolutely fantastic. And, and thank you for doing this today. And you know, to, to all of our attendees, uh, you know, I apologize that we can't get to every question, but please reach out to, to us via email or our websites. You have a, a slew of resources here um, and you, you have a slew of uh, sales managers at Syngenta too that are there to help support you. And we wanna make sure that you have a, a really great uh, mosquito program as well as just an overall excellent bug season. So thank you so much. Right now, I'll just to echo what, uh, what Nikki and Claudia said, I want to thank all of uh, PCT's readers and our listeners for, for joining us, taking some time out of their day to, uh, to get some information uh, from two really great mosquito experts uh, who did uh, terrific presentations. So thanks, everybody, and have a great day. <laughs>